the foreman came around this one evening and just about quitting time. And he says, when are you going to make this machine pay out? I was on a big multiple spindle drill, drilling things. And the, the job had been burnt out. In other words, he, there was no way of making it pay. He said, when are you going to make it pay? And I said, well, uh, never. I says, hell, the job burnt out. It, it'll never pay. And, uh, of course, I was 18 years old and somebody he could chew on a little bit. So anyway, the next morning, I went down to John Deere and I went in and I started checking out. And the foreman come up and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm quitting. Well, he says, you can't get another job. Well, you see, the war was on and that was a defense plant. And you couldn't go in, they, no, no other defense plant could hire you if you quit for something like 30 or 90 days, I think it was. Mm -hmm. they, they could, they, the law said, no, you couldn't be hired in one of those other plants. And I said, well, I don't care. I says, I got a trade. I don't need that. Yeah, 18-year-old guy telling you he's got a trade. <laughs> he looked, yeah, a trade. He said, what kind of a trade do you got? Well, I says, I just happen to have a barber's license. comes to mind, hell on earth, oh my god, oh my god, is the day ever going to end? So that's basically the day here. So, you know, I have the philosophy of work hard, play hard, so. It's not really such a thing as typical, but I do know that the thing is where everybody comes is to get a haircut. So that's about as typical as it gets, is just, they're coming to get a haircut, you know, rain, sleet, snow, so. I just believe in the typical, uh, you know, because it's never the same every day. Well, it's been that out up there on top. Of it. My brow's okay. But my favorite joke was the guy came in and said, I want it all cut off. Nobody heard. Five people waiting. So I got out of my clipper and I pretended I got tripped, went to the whole side of his head. And I tried to talk him into getting a short haircut. They all thought I made a mistake. Well, Ed Armstrong, when he graduated in the spring of 42, he went to barber school. He said, why don't you come down and go to barber school? I was working for a farmer. And so he made the arrangements and I went down and went to school. And, and the, the war was on, so they couldn't get students, so this fellow that ran the school, he was offering free tuition. You had to put up $25, and if you stayed the full six months, well, he'd give you back your $25. A good friend of mine was a barber. I talked to him one day. I wish my part, I wish my guy would sell I want to buy him out, but he wouldn't sell to him. So I got a hold of Ray Hammond, took him across the river, a pal, uh, farm shop there, and I talked him into buying it. Made 50 bucks. Came back with Butler and said, I can't run the shop alone. No barber college will become my partner. 
That's how it started. I was, uh, I was working for a friend of mine. He was a, a painter. We were painting farm buildings, houses and stuff. And it was a day just about like this. And I went home and I was complaining about this crappy weather, and cold. My dad had just got a haircut. And he said, why don't you be a barber? He says, they're warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And that's how I got into it. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I went down and talked to barber school, and next thing I was a barber. Uh, my dad started this. Uh, he came to Waterloo from Des Moines in 1947. Had a barber shop downtown Waterloo where the um, Sullivan Center is. And then in 1960s, 62, he moved to a neighborhood barber shop in Waterloo. And then I joined him in um, 80, 1980. And, um, and we just outgrew that and came over here, so. So with the butlers have been in the barbering profession for a long time. I, I was born into it, I guess. Grandfather, father, I mean, when you really look at it, great grandfather was a barber, grandfather was a barber, dad's a barber, brother's a barber, my aunt's a barber, my other aunt married a barber. You just, sometimes you just can't get away from what you're supposed to do. My whole life I was always like, I'm not going to cut hair, because I grew up in hair salons. And I was like, I'm never going to cut hair, no, I'm going to do something, something more manly. I joined the military, came home. Next thing I know, I'm at 21 years now, cutting hair <laughs> in the family business. The one thing I said I'd never do. Well, I hit a decade of my career. And I was like, oh man. When you hit a decade of your career, you're like, is this all I'm gonna do? Is this it in life? But what else do I know? Comics. I know comics. I'm a collector. I've been in them my whole life. So I put up this one wall, and it started out, it's now just the marble wall. But I put up that one wall, borrowed some cases from my brother he had in storage from his business, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So yeah, so that's the story of the comic store right there, how we became the world's first comic salon. <laughs> uh, let me get it together. I'm Justin Powell, owner and operator of the Fade Room, Waterloo, Iowa. I've been a barber about seven years professionally. You know, people come in a barber shop and they're kind of used to who's cutting their hair. They're not, they're not quick to go into the new guy's chair. And my mentor told me once you, once you do your job and you and you lay that haircut on that client, it could take you all day. But at the end of the day, you look up, you have a client. And then at the end of the year, you look up and you have 200 plus clients. So the challenges are to get the client in the chair because the cutting part is, is easy. The talent is there. It's the everything else, getting them in the chair and making them feel comfortable. All, all I ever wanted to be was an entrepreneur. So this was a catalyst to start that, and I just fell in love with the trade and the people. I think it's just the family, the family atmosphere of Brothers Barbershop and the, the love that we have. It's, it's a brotherhood that we share amongst each other. Uh, my name is uh, Jay the Barber, um, the finishing touch tattoo uh, barbershop. When I, you know, when I hand people the mirror and uh, to see the reaction after they, you know, they get a nice haircut. Especially people that, you know, I've never been to a barber before, just that, the whole experience for them, you know. The, the feeling that people get when they leave, the feeling that, you know, you know, I could, I could, you know, get them a girlfriend or, you know, get them a date that night, something like that, you know. Yeah, or the fact that they feel fresh, clean, you know, and just walk out happy. A rock and roll. I want them to leave here just like energetic, rock and rolled out, ready to party. One thing, having a haircut, a shave, and then having a good one. You know, and you leave it and 
you know, it's just you get put your clothes on, your change, and it's just a great feeling when you leave the shop. You got a clean car, you got a nice haircut. What better way when it's on a sunny day than, you know, having a fresh haircut? And you want to take on a different attitude. You know, you just, it's like getting a new pair of shoes when you're a child. You know, you just thought you can run faster. You know, same with the haircut. It gives you confidence in doing other things that you probably might not have the confidence in doing if you needed a shave and you need a hairline and a haircut. Well, you know, my customers can probably jump in and tell you all kinds of comments and thoughts. That's what he's doing right now. But. I, you know, I, everybody has to have a haircut. So I think that whether you go to a, a, a barber shop or a salon or whatever, it becomes personal. And you just, you hopefully you make a lot of friends and it's at my age now it's interesting because I I've done three generation families also. You know, I've done the grandfather and the son and the grandson, so it makes it kinda neat when you look back and uh, get to know the families. Cut. <laughs>
if there's ever such a thing as a man having the perfect fit all his life, he definitely, being a barber, give him the life that he wanted, and, and the rest of us was blessed to be a part of it. I was working there for Scanlon, and Tommy Waters, he'd gone to the service, and so it was just Scanlon and I. Well, then Bill Williams, he came back into this country, and, and he had barbered a lot around these little towns around here. So Scanlon hired him to come in on Saturday and work, and Bill was fast. And Bill, the first couple of Saturdays he come in, he was taking it all, and I was just, and I came home, I, I really felt bad. And uh, I thought, this got to, something's got to go. And I started working on speed. And after that, I got known there for a while as being the fastest barber around. And I even had a couple guys tell me they wouldn't come to me because I was too fast. <laughs> but I, I really got fast, but I, I just, Figured I had to, you know. And then the Beatles showed up. Long hair showed up. And in about from that time, from the mid '60s till the early '80s, I think uh, about half the barbers in the country went out of business because people wouldn't get their haircut only maybe once a year, or when Grandma came, or whatever. Kids never got haircuts. They grew it long and they wanted it long. I mean, you grow hair down your shoulders, so how many haircuts you get a year? None. When I started there in this Waterloo, Cedar Falls, and Raymond and Evansdale, there was probably roughly 75 to 80 barbers. And in the late 80s, there was probably, well, like we got now, there's probably about 15 barbers, maybe 20. They kind of all, we all disappeared, you know. When I was the president of the Barbers Union, we all charged the same, we all had the same hours, we all had the same days off. And they tried to come in, but I, I controlled pickets, and I made sure they couldn't come in. Well, it takes 30 barbers to be a union. There was only 20 at that time, now there's 10. So now cost cutters and all those come in and ruined the barbering. They started at 8 in the morning, and they closed at 9 at night. Open Sundays, I can see why uh, the folks get the kid at the supper and get her. I always told him he was the last of a dying breed because, you know, the old-fashioned barber shops were just going by the wayside, and the more stylists came in. And and back in Jess's day, men were barbers and women were beauticians, and then all of a sudden they were mixing the the two of them, but. He always stayed true to himself. He said that there was always going to be a need for his kind of barbering, so he stayed with his kind of barbering, and that, again, was a good choice for him. It was very successful, and he was a happy man. He could be difficult sometimes and get after us at times. <laughs> be ornery as hell, right, Jack? But uh, he, he was true to himself, and he loved what he loved, and if you happen to be one of the people he loved, you were lucky. <laughs> Those relationships are probably the best thing as a barber. I mean, you meet so many different people from different walks of life and you build these bond, these bonds with people that are unforgettable. The o I always said, working in that shop, the only difference between me and a bartender is I usually got them, they were usually sober, not always, but usually. Where the bartender, they was pretty. <laughs> I've, I've been quite lucky. I haven't had really any bad. I had a couple of intoxicated clients, you know. They can't stay awake or keep moving, keep talking. I get them done as fast as possible <laughs> and try to ignore them. And, and this one, he come in there and he'd always get a haircut and a shampoo. And if Scanlon worked on him, everything was fine. If I worked on him, 
shampoo stinks, shampoo stinks. So this one day, he got started telling me that and I just stepped around in front of him and I says, you know what I'd do if I was you, Doc? And he said, what? I said, I'd go home and wash my own goddamn hair. <laughs> From then on, the shampoo never stunk. Uh, I, I want to plead the fifth on, <laughs> on that one. No, nah, it's, it's, it's a tough business and dealing with several personalities and, and different conversations, you run into conflict and a time or two there are difficult clients, but all in all, I try to give the best customer service as long as the haircut's good and, and, the, and the customer service is good and, and I do my best, that's what I take pride in. I don't think kids should be scared to tell their parents that they want to do something other than go to an academic college. You need to go be a welder, go be a barber, go be a carpenter, plumber, electrician. These jobs are fading away faster than any other job because nobody wants to nobody wants to be self-employed anymore. Nobody wants to have a skill other than how to read a book or be on a computer. And I don't think that's that's right. This is this is one of the best professions you can get in. My grandpa raised four kids, my dad raised two kids, my great grandpa, even though he did a lot of other odd jobs way back when, he raised, you know, two, three, four kids. It's just this is a good job and I think people are scared to do a, a hands on job nowadays. They don't like the uncertainty of not having the uncertainty of maybe not having health insurance or you know that kind of stuff but you make a living at it it's, it's a good job i think that's what everybody should know i'm the only guy that uses the vibrator Nah, the most rewarding is the money, <laughs> the money. But um, also, um, it's just the fact that I can I can build the relationships, and I've seen a lot of growth since you know. That's a lot of time I spent down here, and it's just like from from me, it's just my attitude and how I've grown. That's probably one of the biggest rewards because I've, I've gotten a lot older, a lot more mature, and I've balanced and I kind of learned what needs to be done, what needs to be said, when it shouldn't be. You know, just a lot of things that I. I, um, uh, it, even the relationships, you know, the, the, the people's hearts I've touched, the hearts, you know, the uh, others that have touched mine, and, and just the things I've learned, you know, just from natural, just not even having to go to college to learn some of these things, just to, for people to give me information and help, and, you know, just give me inspiration and encouragement. Yeah, uh, you know, nowadays there's a lot of barbers that come out of school, um, and, they, you know, they act like uh, the world kind of owes them something, but... You know, it takes a lot of hard work, you know. So my only advice is just to stay down until you come up. And when you come up, stay down. Like I said, you try to get out, but you just can't. So I just decided that this is what I was supposed to do is what I was supposed to do. I've been doing this half my life. I think I'll be doing it till I'm dead, yeah. I don't know what I'd do without this or where I'd be. I can't actually picture myself doing anything else. So you're really not going to retire, you're just going to go somewhere better. I'm going to die behind a chair. There's no <laughs> hips, hands, or butts. We're on a beach somewhere. You don't just say that in a documentary, Jack. Oh. <laughs> that is the end plan, but oh. you know. He wants to work at Disney. Yes, I do.